Hello there. That's Kyle. I'm here with a, a squeaky office chair, some rain ASMR, the shadow of an overhead fan, some noisy cars passing. I find uh, I've been having kind of a hard time sleeping at night, and I've been wanting to get back into literature, reading, reading for the fun of it, reading for any purpose that's like worthwhile. And I figured along with along with getting back into that passion and kind of learning to read again for the fun of it, I figured I would bring you guys along. Might as well make something out of it, not just have it be me just idly reading with my free time. I might as well put something out there, have other people see it, make it something for people to watch, something for people to experience. Uh, so rather than going through a Goosebumps book, which I have a couple more on the horizon, and replacing every other word with fart, poop, or dick, I figured I would take it a little bit more serious and read something a little bit different and try to ease off of the satire. So that being said, uh, the book that I've attempted to start reading multiple times but never gotten fully through that we're going to be reading today it is The Face of Another by Kobo Abe. I recognize I probably butchered that pronunciation, um, but I am not Japanese <laughs> at the end of the day. I, um, I have taken approximately zero hours of Japanese. So you're going to have to remain patient with me for certain pronunciations. I've read through a portion of this book, so... I know some of the stuff to expect, but also I um, I am me at the end of the day. I don't know how much of this I'm going to read, just flipping through. Pretty sure there's about 200, 237 pages, 237. My original plan when making this video was yeah, I'll just read like 100 pages or something, and then at a later date I could pick it up and kind of go from there and just have this be like a a mini series on the channel. But I think I'd just like to start reading and at some point it'll feel right for me to stop reading. <laughs> so I think we're gonna test the waters and figure out what point that may be. So um, I guess I could read all of the fun stuff on the back for anyone uninitiated with what this book is about. So like an elegantly chilling postscript from the Metamorphosis, this classic of post-war Japanese literature describes a bizarre physical transformation that exposes the, dupli the duplicities of the entire world. Yikes, we're already off to a bad start and I'm not even into the book yet. The narrator is a scientist hideously deformed in a laboratory accident, a man who has lost his face and with it his connection to other people. Even his wife is now repulsed by him. His only entry back into the world is to create a mask so perfect as to be undetectable. But as soon as he finds such a mask is more than a disguise, it's an alternate self. A self that is capable of anything. A remorseless meditation of nature, identity, and the social contrast. The face of another is an intellectual horror story of the highest order. I, I don't know about you guys, but that explanation always intrigued me highly. Um, so with that kind of preamble intro flavor, I think I'm just going to start reading this. Uh, the book starts off on page number three. So, uh, yeah, let's get started on this, this little book here. At last you have come, threading your way through the endless passages of the maze with the map you got from him. You have finally found your way to my hideaway, the first room at the top of the creaking harmonium pedal stairs. You've mounted with somewhat shaky steps. You hold your breath and knock. Why is there no answer? Instead, only a young girl comes running like a kitten. She is supposed to open the door for you. You ask if there isn't a message. The girl doesn't answer but smiles and runs away. You peep in, looking for him, but he isn't there. 
Not a trace is left, and an odor of ruin floats in the air. A dead room. Expressionless walls look back at you. You shudder. As you're about to go, though with a feeling of guilt, the three notebooks on the table, together with a letter, catch your eye, and you realize you too are trapped at last. No matter how loathsome the thoughts that well up in you, you cannot resist the temptation. You have torn open the envelope with trembling hands, and you, now you are beginning to read the letter. You're probably humiliated and angry, but I should like you to fix your eyes on the paper, although you don't want to, and go on reading. I want so desperately for you to come safely through this moment and make a step toward me. Have I lost to him, or has he lost to me? Either way, my masked play is over. I have murdered him, and I proclaim myself the criminal. I shall confess everything entirely. Whether you act out of generosity or selfish selfishness, I want you to go on reading. He who has the right to sit in judgment also has the obligation to listen to the defendant's statement. You may be suspected, of course, of false complicity if you simply abandon me as I kneel here. Well, sit down, relax. If the air in your room is bad, open the window at once. A teapot and cups are in the kitchen if you want them. As soon as you settle down, the place will change instantaneously from a hideaway at the end of a maze into a court of law. To make the end of my masked play more real, I've decided to go on waiting while you look through the de deposition. For the time being, just remembering him keeps me from boredom. Well then, let's tr trace back the scheme of my hours. Perhaps it was some time during the morning, about three days ago, from your now. That night, a sticky, rain-laden wind kept badgering the window in its frame. Though it had been too warm during the day, we missed the heat when evening came. According to the papers, it was supposed to turn cold again, but the days had obviously grown longer. Soon, when the rains let up, it would be summer. I was worried as I thought about it. In my present state, I was like wax, limp from the heat. Just thinking of the ceaselessly shining sun made my skin break out in blisters. Then I thought I'd like to settle the matter somehow before summer came. According to the long-term forecast, a continental high-pressure system would begin to spread, and apparently for the next three or four days there would be summery weather. In short, it would be perfect if, within three days, I could finish my preparations for meeting you and run the story right on after this letter. But three days could scarcely be considered enough. For, as you can see, the statement is a re record stretching over a whole year and filling three notebooks the size of folios. It will be a big job to finish up a notebook a day to my satisfaction, rewriting, deleting, and revising. I braced myself for a task and come directly back two or three hours earlier than usual, bringing a midnight stack of meat dumplings liberally spiced with garlic. But vexingly enough, the result was simply that I was again made aware of the utter insufficiency of time. Actually, when I skimmed through the notebooks, I was dissatisfied with the tone, which smacked too much of apology. It was extraordinary for me to be so irked by this soaking night, although it would make anyone gloomy. I did not intend to deny that the final act was rather wretched, but I continued confident that I, that least I was always alert in my own way. Without that confidence, how could I possibly go on tirelessly writing such notebooks, which might constitute either support for my alibi or proof of my guilt? I didn't mean I would not admit defeat, but I still firmly believe that the maze in which I was caught in is the ultimate, the logical tribulation. Yet, contrary to expectations, the notebooks continued to bawl piteously like some penned-up tomcat. I wondered if I should work them over until I was satisfied with their smoothness, forgetting the three-day limit. No. 
That is enough. I can't seem the feeling of having a piece of half-chewed grizzle stick in my throat at the very moment I'm resigned to confess everything. The sections that seem to shriek are all trivial, so I shall be satisfied if I can just get you to read them. Your main irritations are electric drills, the sound of scraping on plate glass and cockroaches, but you can hardly say that these are the essentials of life. You associate electric drills with the dentist, I imagine, but the other two are strange items which I cannot describe other than as psychological hives. I've never yet heard of hives being fatal. Well, let's drop it for now and wind things up. It serves no purpose to pile justifications on justifications. It is more important that you should go on reading the letter. My time quite overlaps with your present that you should keep on reading the notebooks without giving up to the last page when I will catch up with your time. Now you're relaxed, aren't you? Yes, yes. The tea's in the squat green can, the water's already boiled, and now in the thermos jug. So just go ahead and use it. So we're on the first notebook here. It's called the Black Notebook. By the way, the order of the notebooks is by color, black, white, and gray. There's no relationship, of course, between colors and content. I chose haphazardly merely to distinguish among notebooks. First of all, I wonder if I should start with the hideaway. It makes a little difference where I do start, but it's easy to begin talking about that day. It was then, about two weeks ago, that I was about to leave the city for a week on business. It was the first trip I had planned since leaving the hospital. Perhaps it was also a day that greatly impressed you. Ostensibly, the purpose of the trip was to inspect progress in constructing a printing ink factory in Osaka, but this was pretext. Actually, on that day, I shut myself up in my room at the S Apartments, putting the finishing touches to my plans. Here's a sample from my diary entry for that day. May 26, raining. I went into the S apartments I located through a newspaper advertisement. A child playing in the front garden broke out crying as soon as she saw my face. But geographically, the location is good and the, arra and the arrangement of the rooms almost ideal. So I shall settle on this one. There is a piercing, pungent smell of new wood and fresh paint. The room next door seems to be vacant. Something tells me I could probably rent that one too. But at the S Apartments, I did not use another name, nor did I try to conceal my identity. Perhaps this appears indiscreet, but I had my own scheme. Having gone far with the deception about my face, there was nothing to be done about it. Actually, some little girl about primary school age playing in front of the entryway had taken one look at me. I must have appeared like something out of a nightmare and begun sobbing. Of course, the superintendent was stupidly affable, doubtless, because it was business. It was his business. No, the affability wasn't confined to the superintendent. Unfortunately, almost everybody I met gave me ungrudging, only affability. As long as things did not go any further, everyone put up a fine show. And that was to be expected. If they did not want to look me square in the face, at least they had to be affable, I suppose. Anyway, thanks to that, I was able to avoid unnecessary inquisitiveness. Shut off by a wall of affability, I was always completely alone. Perhaps because the S apartments had been so recently constructed, almost half the 18 units were still empty. Although I did not request it, the superintendent showed me the farthest room on the second floor, next to an emergency stairway. That's the long and short of it. Of course, his picking out that particular unit for me was incontestably valuable. The bathroom was ordinary, ordinary, not first class. A desk provided along the two chairs, and there was a terrace-like bay window, which the other rooms did not have. Furthermore, a parking lot with four or five places was located at the bottom of the emergency stairway. And from there, one could get out directly by a side driveway. This was quite useful too. 
I had to be prepared from the start, so I immediately paid a three months deposit. At the same time, I told the superintendent to buy bedding from a nearby shop and have it delivered. The man was increasingly less able to conceal his delight and kept on prattling endis- endlessly about the sunniness of this place and the, excellent of the excellence of the ventilation. When those subjects of conversation were exhausted, he would go on jabbering about himself. But when he held out the key to me, it slipped from his grasp, luckily, and fell to the floor, making a sharp clatter. With an abashed expression, he hastily tore the seal from the gas inlet valve and departed. Thank God. If false veneer always came off so easily, what a relief it would be. It had already become so dark, I could not count the fingers on the hand I held before my face. The room, unused to human habitation, was cold and unaffable. But this was better than the affable man. I'd grown terribly familiar with darkness since the event in question. How wonderful it would be, frankly, if everybody in the world would suddenly lose his sight or forget the existence of light. Immediately, there would be agreement about form. Every body would accept the fact that a loaf of bread is a loaf of bread, whether triangular or round. The girl a little while ago would have kept her eyes shut and listened to my voice. If she had, perhaps we could have become friendly and I could have taken her to the playground and we could have eaten ice cream together. Just because there was light, she heedlessly thought that a triangular loaf of bread was not bread, but a triangle. This thing called light is itself transparent, but it apparently changes into something non-transparent. But there is light, actually. In darkness, is that is at most a stay of execution with a definite time limit. When I opened the window, a rain-drenched wind blew in like black vapor. Without thinking, I inhaled it. I took off my sunglasses and wiped away the tears, whereupon the tops of telephone poles and the wires to the shop set back along the main street and the line of the eaves caught the light from the passing cars and shone dimly like traces of chalk left on the the blackboard. There was a sound of footsteps approaching the hallway. With a gesture that had become habit, I readjusted my glasses. It was a man delivering the bedding I had ordered. I stuck the money under the door and asked him to leave the bedding in the hallway. Somehow it seemed that everything was ready from the start. When I took off my coat and opened the closet, I found a mirror attached to the back of the door. I took off my glasses again, removed my mask, and looking in the mirror, began to undo the bandages. The three layers of cloth were swollen with sweat and felt twice as heavy as when I had put them on in the morning. As I removed the bandages, a leech-like mask crept across my face. The keloid scars, swollen and distended, red and black intertwining. How repulsive. Since this was daily routine, I should be used to it soon. I was vexed even more by my unwarranted surprise. When I thought about my feeling, it seemed baseless, irrational. Why did one have to put up a hue and cry about anything so trifling as the skin on one's face, which, after all, was only a smart, small part of the human capsule? Such prejudice and sad ideas, of course, are not especially strange. For example, belief in magic, racial prejudice, groundless fear of snakes, or the morbid terror of cockroaches that I mentioned in my letter. While such a situation would be understandable in a pimply adolescent who lives in visions, it was ridiculous for me. The section head of a respectable laboratory, moored securely to this world by an anchor-like weight, to be afflicted by psychological hives. I realized there was no particular reason for my abhorrence of the leech-like scars, but I was unable to stop my suffering, although fed up with the whole thing. Of course, I intended to try. Rather than run aimlessly away, it would be best, I suppose, to face the situation squarely and get used to it once and for all. If I made nothing of it, then surely no one else would either. With this thought in mind, and of my own accord, I had made my face the subject of conversation at the Institute. 
I had compared myself, for example, to the masked monsters of television, deliberately exaggerated. I had stressed the advantages of seeing without being seen, since my expression was inscrutable to others and appeared amused by the whole thing. To accustom others to my face was the best shortcut to getting used to it myself. The stratagem seemed to work. I was then able to get along at the laboratory with no sense of constraint. There is more to those popular masked monsters too than appears. I began to understand why they turn up over and over again in comic books and on television. My mask itself, were it not for the scars underneath, spreading like webs, was comfortable enough. If covering our bodies with clothes represents a cultural step forward, there's no guarantee that in the future, masks will not be taken equally for granted. Even now, they're often used in important ceremonies and festivals. I do not quite know how to put it, but I wonder if a mask, being universal, enhances our relations with others more than it does a naked face. Sometimes I believed I was on the way to recovery, but I did not truly realize the repulsiveness of my face. Meanwhile, the leech-like corrosion continued its steady progress under the bandage. Despite the doctor's assurance that chillblains caused by liquid air were not as deep as fire burns, and that according, accordingly recovery should, not, should be rapid, the leech scars overcame one line of defense after another in spite of every possible countermeasure. X-ray treatments, cortisone shots, and antibiotics taken internally. The SCAR army called out its reinforcements, one after the other, to occupy new areas of my face. For example, one day, it was the noon break and I had just returned from a liaison, liaison meeting between my colleagues in another department. A young assistant, a girl, graduated this year, approached me with a mischievous, mischievous expression turning over the pages of some book. Look, doctor, this is a fascinating picture. Under her slim, teasing finger lay a line drawing by Klee entitled False Face. The features were divided horizontally by parallel lines, and depending on how the picture was viewed, could be conceived of as a bandage wrapped around and round. Slight, narrow apertures revealed only the eyes and mouth, and the expression was expressionless to the point of cruelty. Suddenly I was overcome by an indescribable feeling of humiliation. Of course, the girl had an intended malice. What had given her the idea was basically the result of my own conscious provocation. Easy does it. If I were to get angry at this point, all my efforts would fail. Although I admonished myself thus, I was so upset that the picture appeared to be my very own face, seen through the girl's eyes. A false face. Seen but unable to look back. It was intolerable to think that I appeared to the girl like this. Suddenly, I ripped the book in two, and with it my heart. From the tear, my insides came running out like a rotten egg. I became an empty, cast-off skin. Piling the torn pages together, I regretfully handed them back to the girl. But it was too late. The thermostat of the isometric, isothermic tank, which in normal circumstances was inaudible, made a tremendous noise like the bending of a zinc plate. The girl's knees knocked together with such force under her skirt that they might as well have been fused. It seemed that I could not yet really comprehend the meaning behind my confusion at the time. I was so ashamed I writhed in anguish. Still, I did not rightly grasp what I had to be ashamed about. No, if I had tried, I might have been able to understand, but perhaps I was taking refuge in what is commonly called childish behavior, instinctively avoiding a deeper search. I can hardly believe that the face is so important to a man's existence. A man's worth should be gauged by the content of his work, Possibly the convolutions of the surface of the brain have something to do with it, but his face certainly does not. If the loss of a face can cause conspic conspicuous change in the scale of evaluation, it may well be owing to a fundamental emptiness of content. 
But soon afterwards, several days after the incident of the picture, I was forced to realize, to my dismay, that the relative importance of a face far exceeds such wishful thinking. The warning came from the inside, stealthily. Absorbed in my defenses against the outside, I was taken by surprise and easily overcome. The attack was so sharp and sudden that even while I was being overcome, I was unable to grasp it at once. That evening, when I returned home, I had an unusual longing to listen to Bach. It did not have to be Bach necessarily, but in my hangnail, wound up mood, I wanted no jazz, no Mozart. Bach was indeed the most appropriate. I have never been a connoisseur of music, but perhaps I use it well. Sometimes when my work was not making much headway, I chose music in keeping with my needs. If I chose to interrupt my thinking for a while, there was a piquant jazz. When I wanted impetus for a spurt, there was the speculative bar talk. If I, de if I desired a feeling of freedom, there was the Beethoven of the quartets. When I wished to concentrate to a point, there were spiral movements of Mozart, and then Bach. He was the best for times when I needed spiritual balance. But for a moment, I suspected I had mistaken the record. If not, certainly the machine was out of kilter. The music sounded insane. I had never heard Bach. I have never heard such Bach. If you suppose Bach to be balm for the soul, imagine it is nothing but a lump of clay, neither poison nor balm. It was meaningless and stupid. Every phrase played seemed to me like quite like a dusty, sticky lollipop. At precisely that moment, you filled two cups with black tea and brought them into the room. When I said nothing, you must have thought I was absorbed in my listening and you left, keeping your footsteps as quiet as possible. Then it appeared to me that I was the one who was mad. Even so, I could not believe it. How should a wound on the face have any effect on one sense of hearing? But the deformed Bach, no matter how I listened, would not go back to normal again. I could only assume the wound had produced this effect. I stuck a cigarette through the slit in the bandage and asked myself with a nervous fidget what I had lost along with my face. Apparently, my philosophy about faces stood in need of fundamental revision. Then, suddenly, as if the floor of time had slipped away, I found myself in a memory of 30 years ago. The event I had thought of not even once since the abruptly and vividly came back. It concerned my elder sister's false hair. I don't quite know how to put it, but I felt the wig to be unspeakably indecent and immoral. One time I sneaked it away and burned it up. My mother discovered this. She was strangely insistent. She questioned me, and although my action had been intended to do right, when it came to being examined, I did not know what to answer and just stammered and blushed. No, if I had tried, perhaps I might have been able to answer. But such things are sullied by being spoken aloud. I think my very strict moral sense made me be silent. And if I replaced false hair with the word face, the same unbearable feeling of frustration would fit in perfectly with the crumbling and empty sounds of the Bach. When I stopped the record and came out of the study, as if impelled, you were just in the act of polishing some glasses, lined up before you in the dining room. I cannot trace back what happened to me, but coming up against your resistance, I was at last able to grasp the meaning of my own position. I bore down on your shoulder with my right hand and tried to thrust my left hand under your skirt. You gave a shriek and suddenly straightening your, straightening your legs, jumped up. The chair fell over and glass crashed to the floor. We stood, transfixed, breathless, with the fallen chair between us. Admittedly, my action must have been too headstrong, but I also had some excuse. It was a desperate effort to regain all at once when I was beginning to lose because of my ravaged face. Since the accident, the two of us had completely stopped sexual relations. In theory, I can see that my face was an incidental reason, but in reality, perhaps I was sneaking around, trying a direct test of your response. 
I had been driven into a corner, and there was nothing to do but launch a frontal counterattack. Apparently, I had tried to convince you by my action that the face was a mere screen, an illusion of no importance. The feel of your inner thigh still glowed like powdered alabaster on my fingertips. A cry stuck in my throat like a bundle of thorns. How much I wanted to say, but I could not form a single word. Excuses, consolation, blame. If we had talked about it, we would have been able to decide on one or the other, and such a decision would hardly have been enough. If it were a question of excuses and consolation, I would have preferred to melt away like smoke. Supposing I chose to attack, well, if I tore your face off, at least you would be the same as I, or some even more horrible goblin. Suddenly you began to sob. It was an unnerving sound, like air escaping from a faucet when the water drops. Suddenly a deep hole popped open in my face. It seemed gouged out so deep that with my whole body in it, there would still have been more room. A liquid, like pus, from a decayed tooth dribbled down. Terrific stenches in the room, catching the sound, came swarming out like cockroaches from inside the chair, from the corner of the cabinet, from the drain in the sink, from the lampshade discolored with dead bodies of insects. I wanted a stopper for the hole in my face. Anything would do. How I wanted to put an end to this anguish, this game of blind man's bluff with no blind man. It was a mere hair's breadth from this point to making plans for a mask. Basically, the idea was not all that extra extraordinary. Like some wind-blown seed, it needed only a speck of ground and a drop of water to grow. And so the next day, without much enthusiasm or seriousness, as if the whole thing had been predetermined, I began looking through the indices, indices, I'm not 100% sure on this word, I'm going to say indices, of old scientific journals. It must have been the year before last, sometime in the summer, that there had been an article on the artificial organs made of plastic. I would cover up the holes in my face with a plastic mask. Of course, according to one theory, a mask is apparently the expression of an extremely metaphysical aspiration to give oneself a kind of transcendental disguise. For the mask is not simply something uh, compensatory compensatory. There we go. Compensatory. I apologize. Some of these words are rather lengthy and it is uh, 10 o'clock on a Sunday. So I pray you can understand some of my, my difficulty when reading this. Even I did not regard it as anything like a shirt on a pair of pants that I could change at will. However, I really don't know about the ancients who believed in idols and about adolescents who imitate them. But for me, at this point, it is probably useless to decorate the altars of my next life with masks. No matter how many faces I have, there is no changing the fact that I am me. I was just attempting to fill in a too long intermission in my life with a trivial masked play. I soon found the... I soon found what I was looking for. According to the literature, it was apparently possible to construct a mask that would simulate real skin, at least outwardly. But there were a number of unresolved points, such as mobility. If I were to somehow make it, most certainly I had to achieve expression, presumably by linking the mask to the muscles governing expression. I wanted something that could expand and contract freely, something that could laugh and cry. Even supposing the project were feasible at the present day level of high molecular chemistry, it did not seem within reach of a mere amateur's capacities. Yet at that time, the mere possibility of the venture was a wonderful tranquilizer for me. If I could have the if I could not have the tooth taken care of, I could at least take a temporary painkiller. At once, I decided to look up Dr. K, the author of the article on artificial organs, to hear what he had to say. K's response on the telephone, however, was extremely rude. He seemed unenthusiastic, to say the least. 
Perhaps he felt some resentment at my being engaged in the same high molecular work as he, but he agreed to see me some time after four. I handed over the switch inspection to the man in charge of the overtime shift, and when I had disposed of two or three remaining chips, I immediately left. The street was a bright scent of fragrant olive. I was unreasonably jealous of the smell and the light. As I waited for a taxi, I had the impression of being stared at from all sides, as if I were some sort of interloper. All this was merely a negative image with black and white reversed, and I stoically bore the too brilliant sunlight, thinking that if I could just get my hands on a mask, I should at once be able to recover the positive. The building I went to was situated on a residential street somewhat difficult to access, near a station on the inner belt of the transit system. A rather unimposing sign, Kay's High Molecular Chemistry Institute, hung outside the commonplace house. Just inside the gateway stood three rabbit hutches carelessly piled on top of each other. In the narrow waiting room, along with the ashtray stand and a shabby wooden bench, lay a number of old magazines. Vaguely, I began to regret having come. Institute sounded respectable enough, but this was the kind of setup some neighborhood practitioner might choose. I wondered if Kay weren't merely some quack who was taking advantage of the uncertainty of his patients. As I looked around, I saw two photographs in slightly dirty frames decorating the walls. One showed a side view of a girl's face. She looked like a chinless field mouse. The other, doubtless after plastic surgery, showed a much better face over which hovered a faint smile. My accumulated sleeplessness turned into a heavy stiffness began to spread to my forehead. The hard bench was beginning to make me restless when finally the nurse showed me into the next room. The light filtering through the blinds lay in white, milk-like pools. On the table by the window, a variety of unusual instruments, like hypodermic equipment, was menacingly laid out. Beside the table stood a cabinet of medical charts and a swivel chair with arms. Opposite was a waist-high dressing cubicle on rollers and a single paneled screen with a metal frame. Standard accoutrements that made me feel increasing, increasingly disconsolate. Disconsolate. I lit a cigarette. As I arose to find an ashtray, I was suddenly startled by the contents of an enamel tray on the table. An ear, three fingers, an arm, and the side of a cheek from the eyelids to the lips lay there, casually arranged with the freshness that bespoke their recent removal. I felt nauseous. They looked more real than genuine organs. I would never have supposed a replica could produce such a brutal impression. Although I could not see the cut edges, and knew that the objects were unmistakably nothing more than molded plastic, I had the illusion that I could smell the stench of dead flesh. I love when people drive past super fast like that. Suddenly Kay appeared from behind the screen. I heaved a sigh of relief at his surprisingly mild appearance. Frizzy hair, thick, rimless spectacles like the bottom of tumblers, fleshy jowls, a medicinal odor to which I was long accustomed to gave me a feeling of intimacy with him. Now it was his turn to be flustered. He studied my face with an expression of amazement, my card in his hand, and for a while he said nothing. Well then, you... He stammered, glancing again at the card. His tone was considerably more temperate than the one he had used on the telephone. Have you come as a patient? How was I to answer him? No matter how good Kay's technique was supposed to be, he could not possibly satisfy my ambitions. What I expected at most was his advice, but it was not my intention to hurt him by saying it to his face. Kay apparently took my silence for timidity and uh, added sympathetically, please sit down. What seems to be the trouble? Well, you see, there was an explosion of liquid oxygen during an experiment I was performing. 
Perhaps because I was always accustomed to using liquid nitrogen anyway, I was careless. Are they keloid scars? On the whole face. I apparently have a predisposition to keloids. The doctor who diagnosed it fumbled and only irritated the scars, and there was a relapse. He just gave up. But it appears to be all right around the lips. Meanwhile, I took off my sunglasses. My eyes are intact too, thanks to my glasses. Perhaps it was fortunate I had to wear them for my myopia. Myopia. That was lucky, he exclaimed, as if it were he who was scarred. And then he added eagerly, at least you have your eyes and lips, but if you couldn't move them, it would be really bad. Camouflage would be worthless, no matter how much form you constructed. Kay appeared enthusiastic about his work. He stared intently into my face, and in his mind, he already seemed to be drawing a rough sketch. I suddenly changed the subject, subject so as not to disappoint him. I read your article. It must have been last year in the summer, as I recall. That's right. It was last year. And you know, I was amazed. I hadn't dreamed anything so elaborate could be done. Kay picked up a shriveled finger with apparent satisfaction as he gently let it fall to the palm of his hand and said, You've got to have per perseverance in this work, you know? Don't you think these fingerprints are quite the same as the real thing? They are much so. Actually, that the police department asked to register them. Do you use plaster of Paris for making the mold? No, I use a silicon base. Because plaster of Paris always skips the details. Look, see how clearly even the cuticle of the nail comes out. I gingerly picked it up with the tips of my fingers. It had the sort of feel of a living thing, and while I realized it was fabrication, I had a weird sensation that it could infect me with, well, with death. It's something of a profane feeling, isn't it? I expect a human body is... Kay triumphantly took up another finger and stood it vertically on the surface of the table, with the cut edge down. A dead man seemed to be thrusting his finger, finger upward through the boards of the table. The trick is to deliberately make them slightly dirty like this. If you went along with the patient's ideas to prettify them, you would get something very strange. For example, this is a middle finger, so on the back side of the first joint, I tried applying this brownish spot. It looks a little like a tobacco stain, doesn't it? Do you put it on with a brush or something? Not at all. For the first time, Kay laughed out loud. If you painted it down, if you painted it on, it would come right off, wouldn't it? I built up different color elements from underneath. For example, for the nail, acetic acid vinyl, and for the joints, the shadows of wrinkles, in places along the veins, a faint bluish green. Isn't this simply handicraft? Probably anyone could do it. That's true, he said, jiggling his leg, but such stuff as this elementary, but such stuff as this is elementary compared to the work on the face. Whatever you say, it's the face that's hardest. First of all, there's the expression. As soon as you put on a bump or a wrinkle, even no more than a tenth of a millimeter, it takes on a profound meaning. But you can't make it move at all, I suppose, can you? That's expecting too much. Kay spread his legs and directly faced me. I've put all my efforts into making the outside of the face. I haven't come to movement. But of course, you can partially make up for this deficiency by choosing an area where there's little motion. But there's another problem. Ventilation. In your case, I wouldn't know until I looked. But judging from what I see, you are perspiring even through the bandage. The sweat glands must still be alive, because with the sweat glands alive, you can't cover the whole face with something that allows no ventilation. It's not only physiologically bad, but it would be so stifling I doubt you could stand it even half a day. It's best to be moderate about this kind of thing. An extreme change would be as laughable as an old man fitting himself up with baby teeth. 
Any modification that doesn't call attention to itself is by far the most effective. Can you take the bandage off yourself? I can, but musing how best to tell him that I was not a patient, as Kay seemed to think, I said, to tell the truth, I'm in something of a fix. Since I haven't completely made up my mind, I suppose there's no particular need at this point to be so fussy about the facial injury to the extent of making such stopgap substitutes as these. Indeed there is, Case spoke emphatically, as if to encourage me. Injuries to the body, especially the face, are not treated simply as problems of form. We should rather speak of them as belonging in the province of mental hygiene. Otherwise, who would willingly devote his efforts into cosmetic work? As a doctor, I have my pride. I should never be satisfied to be only a craftsman making imitations. Yes, I understand. Do you really? He asked. You're the one who said my work was only on the level of my handicraft. I didn't particularly mean it in that way. Don't worry about it, please. Kay rejoined with the generosity of an understanding schoolmaster. When it comes right down to it, you're not the only one who vacillates. No, it's common enough to feel resistance to having one's face manufactured. Perhaps, since modern times, even now primitive men make false faces as a matter of course. I'm unfortunately not enough of a specialist to understand why attitudes have changed. But there's statistical proof. For example, if you consider exterior wounds, facial injuries about one and a half times as numerous as injuries to the four extremities, and yet the number of people who request treatment for the loss of a limb or even a finger is 80% higher. There's clearly some taboo about the face. On this point, even doctors are in agreement. There are only a few opinionated men who treat my work as that of a high-class money-grubbing beautician. But it isn't particularly strange to respect content more than appearance, is it? Do you mean respecting contents that have no container? I have no faith in that. As far as I'm concerned, I firmly believe that a man's soul is housed in his skin. Metaphorically speaking, of course, it's no metaphor, he continued soothingly, but in a conclusive tone, man's soul is in his skin. I believe that to the letter. During the war, when I was in the army as a doctor, I learned that through intense experience. It was routine on the battlefield for men to have their limbs and legs shot off and their faces smashed to pieces. But what do you think the wounded appreciated most? It wasn't their lives, nor even the recovery of their faculties. What concerned men more than anything was whether or not their looks would be the same as before. At first, I too would laugh them down, because on the battlefield, any value outside of bodily health and the number of stars in your insignia did not signify. However, one time I came across a soldier who didn't seem to be badly hurt outside of a horribly disfigured face. But just when he was on the point of leaving the hospital, he committed suicide. He had been in a state of shock. Since then, I have come to observe with the greatest care the appearance of soldiers who have been wounded. And ultimately, I've come to one conclusion, and it's a distressing one. Serious exterior injuries, especially to the face, leave definite mental trauma. Well, I suppose there are such cases, but as long as there's not exactly any basis in theory for the idea, I should not think of it as a general law, no matter how many instances there were. Suddenly, an intolerable anger welled up in me. I had not come to talk about myself. Actually, I myself don't feel so keenly about it yet, I went on. I beg your pardon. I'm terribly sorry. I've been wasting your valuable time. I'm so undecided. When I'm so undecided. Please, just a minute, he chuckled confidently. Perhaps I have imposed on you, but I'm quite certain of what I'm saying. If you let things go as they are, most assuredly you'll spend your whole life in bandages. The very fact of you wearing them at present is proof you think them infinitely better than what's underneath. Well, 
for the present the face you had before you were hurt is still more or less living in the memories of the people around you, but time doesn't wait. Gradually that memory will grow faint. People who never saw your original face will come to know you. In the end, you will be sentenced for non-payment on the promissory note of your bandage. Although you're alive, you'll be consigned to the oblivion. You're exaggerating. What do you mean by that? You can see the number among the injured who have lost the use of their arms and legs. Even blind men and deaf mutes are not so extraordinary. But where have you seen a man without a face? You probably haven't. Do you think they have all evaporated to thin air? I don't know. I'm not interested in other people. And inadvertently, my voice had become strident. It was like being severely lectured and forced to buy a lock after one has gone to the police station to report a theft. But Kay had not given up. I'm sorry, but apparently you don't really understand. The face in the final analysis is the expression. The expression, how shall I put it? Well, the expression is something like an equation by which we show our relationship with others. It's a roadway between oneself and others. If it's blocked by a landslide, even those who have been at pains to travel it will think you are some you are now some un, uninhabited, dilapidated house and perhaps pass by. That's quite all right. There's no need for them to force themselves to stop in. In short, you mean you're going your own way, don't you? Is that wrong? It's an established theory in infant psychology that the human animal can validate his ego only through the eyes of others. Have you ever seen the expressions of imbeciles or schizophrenics? If the roadway is left blocked too long, one ultimately quite forgets there is one. To avoid being cornered, I tried to strike back at random. Yes, indeed. So let's suppose that expression is precisely what you say. Isn't it all rather contradictory, though? How in the world will you restore expression with your way of doing things, which is to put makeshift cover over only a certain part of your face? Don't worry. If you're concerned, please leave that to me. That's my specialty. At least I have confidence that I can offer you something better than your bandages. Well, now, shall we take them off? I'd like you to let me take a few pictures, and with them, as a basis, we'll make a graduated selection by a process of elimination of the elements necessary for the res restoration of expression. We'll pick some stable places with little mobility, and I beg your pardon, but I wanted only to get away. I forgot all about keeping up appearances and began to entreat and implore him. Rather than that, I wonder if you wouldn't just sell me that one finger. As I anticipated, Kay was struck dumb with amazement and rubbing his wrist along his thigh, said, a, a finger? This one, do you mean? If you won't sell a finger, an ear, or anything else, we'll do a very... I'm sorry, that was butchered. If you won't sell a finger, an ear, or anything else, we'll do very well. But it's a question of Kaylid's scars on your face, I thought. I'm sorry. If it's impossible, I'll get along without it. But I don't understand. It's not particularly that I can't sell you a finger, but but even that is surprisingly expensive. Anyhow, for each one, I have to make an antimony cast. You see. The cost of materials alone comes to about $50, and that's a low estimate. Fine. I really don't understand what you're thinking of. He didn't have to understand. The whole exchange between us seemed to be proceeding on two quite divergent rails. I took out my wallet, and as I counted out the money, I repeated my earnest apologies. I left holding the artificial finger in my pocket like a dangerous weapon. The shadows and light of evening were extremely distinct, but seemed more artificial than the finger. When some young boys who were playing catch in a narrow lane saw me, they changed color and pressed away from me against the fence. Their faces looked as though they were dangling by the ears of the clothespins. If I took off the bandage and showed them the real thing, 
they'd be a lot more surprised. I was seized with an impulse to rip off my bandages in earnest and to jump into the midst of this landscape that seemed like pasted bits of paper. But without a face, it was impossible for me to take a single step away from my bandages. The picture of me brandishing the fake finger in my pocket with all my might and ripping that landscape to pieces floated into my mind. I was no more affected by Kay's disagreeable remark about being buried alive than by filling of the molar. Well, look, if I could cover my face with an imitation completely indistinguishable from the real thing, however fake the landscape might be, it couldn't make me an outcast. That evening, I stood the artificial finger on the table like a candle and spent a sleepless night endlessly pondering one aspect and then another of the fake, which appeared more genuine than the real thing. Perhaps beyond that, I was imagining the masked ball of the fairy tale in which I was... Hold on, we're restarting this entire paragraph. Perhaps before that, I was imagining the masked ball of the fairy tale in which I would before long appear. But wasn't it actually symbolic that even an idle fancy... I could not help but add a fairy tale commentary. I have written about this before, but I made my plans lightheartedly, as if I were skipping over some narrow ditch. Of course, I had thought ab about. Of course, I had thought out no final solution. Was it because I strove in my subconscious to consider the mask itself simply an extension of an entirely consistent attitude of self-defense? according to which the loss of my face was not the loss of anything particularly essential? From one point of view, the problem was not the mask itself. There seemed rather to be at work here a challenge to the face and to the authority of the face. If I had not come to feel cornered because of the collapsed Bach and your rebuff, perhaps I could have felt considerably more nonchalant and glib about my face. Yet, a deep black shadow grew in my heart, like India ink dropped in a glass of water. It was Kay's idea that faces were a roadway between men. When I reflected on it now, if I had been struck with a rather unfortunate impression of Kay, it was not because of his complacency nor his insistence on medical treatment, but apparently because of his thought. If one accepted such reasoning, I, who had lost my face, was destined to be shut up forever in a solitary cell with no roadway. And so a mask become, became invested with a terribly profound meaning. My plan was to attempt to break out of my jail cell on that I would stake my very being, and accordingly, my present condition was a suitably desperate state. Indeed. What we mean when we say terrible conditions is conditions which we are aware of as being terrible. It was this awareness that I could not possibly accept. Even I recognize that a roadway between people is a, necess a necessity. I keep on writing these sentences to you precisely because I do not fully recognize this. But I wonder if the face alone is the one and only roadway. I cannot believe it. My doctoral dissertation, which was on rheology, was properly understood by people who had never seen my face. Of course, with a mere scientific thesis, one could not pretend to dispose of the matter of intercourse between people. Actually, what I ask of you is quite something else again. I want some sign of a completely meaningful human relationship. The lines are indistinct. Call it heart or, or call it soul. Because this association is far more complex than a relationship between animals who express themselves by their odors alone, I suppose facial expression is an adequate communicating roadway. Just as currency is a more evolved system of exchange than barter. But even currency is after all simply a means. It's not almighty in every single situation. In some cases, checks or money orders are more convenient in others, jewels or precious metals. Isn't it a preconception derived from habit to suppose that the soul and the heart are in the same category 
and can be negotiated only through the face? Isn't it common to find a single poem or book or record that communicates with the heart far more profoundly than a hundred years of scanning faces? If a face were indispensable, a blind man couldn't know such things as human characteristics, could he? I am more concerned about intercourse between humans being narrowing and stereotyped by too much dependence on the habit of faces. Actually, a good example is the stupid prejudice about the color of skin. To judge the soul's roadway according to the color of the face is something describable only as an attitude without disregards to the soul. Excursus. When I read this over now, I suppose I did not want to be bound by my, by my face, but I had apparently been making transparent self-justifications. For example, I was at first attracted to you through your face, and even now when I think of the distance between us, the measure of it is the remoteness of your expression and nothing else. Yes, for quite some time, I should have frankly imagined that our positions were reversed, uh, you were the one who had lost your face. Under evaluation and over evaluation of the face are equally, equally artificial. So it would seem that I referred before to my sister's wig in order to explain the feelings of not wanting to cling to my face. But I'm dubious about the sustainability of that reference. In short, isn't my concern about my face simply a common adolescent interest in and and antagonism to cosmetics. Thank you, rogue person flying past my apartment building. I appreciate you doing whatever you do. Or perhaps I was beginning to feel slightly jealous of the fact that my sister was trying to make herself attractive. Incidentally, one more thing. I read once in some newspaper review a strangely thought-provoking article about a Korean with Japanese blood who, in order to look more Korean, went to the trouble of undergoing plastic surgery. This was clearly a stress of facial restoration, but it could never be said the man was implicated in prejudice. In the final analysis, I realized I hadn't comprehended a single thing. If the opportunity presented itself, I should really like a very much to hear what kind of advice the Korean would give someone like me who had lost their face. Finally, I tired of this soliloquy about a face, this soliloquy about no progress. But there was no particular reason either to abandon the plans that I had been at pains to begin. I began to devote close attention to technical observations. The artificial finger had extremely interesting aspects. The more I looked at it, the more I appreciated the fine points of its construction. It expressed as much as an actual finger to me. From the tension of the skin, I should suppose it was the finger of a person aged about 30. A flat nail, squashed areas on the sides, deep wrinkles in the joints, four small cuts in the row like shark skills. It probably belonged to a person engaged in light handwork. Yet, why was it so ugly, repulsive, a kind of special unsavoriness, neither of the dead nor of the living? No, apparently nothing had gone wrong. Was it rather that the reconstruction was too faithful? If so, that would be true of my mask, too. So, it could be that if one clung too closely to reality, the result might well be far from realistic. It may be all right to be particular about faces, but first take a look at the ugliness. It is quite true, of course, that an accurate copy may actually be unrealistic. However, could you conceive of a formless finger, a snake without length, a pot without volume, a triangle without angles? Unless such things exist on another planet, they are not seen with one's eyes. If they were, even a face without expression wouldn't be exceptional. Even if such face did sometimes occur, it could hardly be a face. Indeed, masks have this much raison d'etre. Then, 
the problem may lie in the physical element. First of all, it would be curious to speak of a form that couldn't move as one's person. If this finger could only move, it would look much better. As an experiment, I picked it up and tried working it. It did in fact seem more realistic than when it was standing on the table. So there was no need worrying over that point. Thus I insisted from the beginning that mine must be a mass that moved. But I was still somehow dissatisfied. What in heaven's name could be the cause of such concern? I focused all my attention comparing the artificial member with my own finger. There definitely was a difference, but suppose it was not the fault of its, be of its being severed, nor the problem of movement. Could it be the quality of the skin? I wonder. Perhaps. There was a characteristic difference that could not be masked simply by form or color. Marginalia 1. On the feel of skin. Human skin seems to be protected by a transparent matter having no pigmentation. Is not the look of skin, accordingly, one of complex interaction between the light, ra light rays reflected from the surface and those which, having passed through the surface, are again reflected from the pigment? This effect was not, to be, was not obtained in the case of the molded finger, since the pigment was directly on the surface inquire of a specialist about the composition and optical properties in this transparent matter in his skin. Marginalia 2. Important subjects of investigation, wear of the material, elasticity and flexibility, fixing process, procedure with the edge line, ventilation, procurement of the model, and general procedure. To be sure, the very fact I have tried to put these things down faithfully will bore you, and thus I shall lose everything in the end. But I should like to have you at least sense the atmosphere surrounding the early days of the mask, which had come into being almost unperceived by me, regardless of any ideas by it, about it, not by it. First of all, the transparent substance in the skin is a type of horny albumen called serotin, keratin? Keratin. I want to say keratin. Seratin. C-E-R-A-T-I-N, for those of you who are confused. I'm going to say seratin. Which contains very small fluorescent bodies. For the handling of the edge line, I decided that I should have to make the thickness of the flange no larger, if possible, than a small wrinkle. Later, I hoped somehow to be able to overcome any remaining artificiality by devising a suitable beard. Moreover, even the problem of flexibility, which I foresaw as the greatest obstacle, was not at all insurmountable physiologically. Quite obviously, the facial muscles are the basis of expression. Each muscle pulls in a fixed direction, and contraction and expansion occur along these lines. The skin tissue, which has a fixed directional mobility, lies over them, and the cellular fibers of one apparently join at approximately right angles. According to the medical books I borrowed from the Institute Library, the groupings of fibers in the skin are called longer lines. Fortunately, a certain type of plastic showed great flexibility when subjected to directional stress. If I didn't begrudge the time it would take, I could resolve the problem with about this so much information. And so I decided to begin test in the corner of a laboratory on the elasticity of the flat epithelial cells. Here too, my colleagues were mo most tolerant. I aroused almost no suspicions and was able to make constant use of the equipment. However, the procurement of a model and general procedure seemed impossible to manage technically. For the model, that is, the taking of the first impression to reproduce skin details, I should have to borrow someone else's face, no matter how disagreeable this might be. 
Of course, just a little skin surface with some oil and sweat, gl sweat glands would do, since I would transform it in accordance to my own facial structure. I would not be walking around dangling the face of another. There would be no need to worry about infringing on someone else's copyright. However, even that were the case, even if that were the case, extremely serious doubts welled up in me. Wouldn't the mask be similar to my original face at all? By basing his model on the skull structure, a skilled craftsman could reproduce a completely lifelike appearance. If that were true, then it was the underlying frame that ultimately determined one's looks. I should be absolutely incapable of leaving the face I was born with, except by shaving down the bones and disregarding the anatomical basis of expression, which in it itself could hardly be called expression. The thought confused me. After all, wouldn't the meaning of the mask be com completely negated, no matter how skillfully it was constructed, if I wore one identical to myself? I like that line. Fortunately, I remembered a friend of mine from high school who was specializing in paleontology. It might well be that reconstructing animals from fossils that he dug, dug up formed a part of his work. I consulted the directory and learned that, as luck would have it, he had remained at the university. I intended to discuss the matter by telephone, but as it was some time since our graduation, he was eager to see me and suggested we meet. All right, that's like roughly the same angle you guys were at, right? If not, it's an angle change. I'm sorry. I, uh, I rolled too much in my chair. I, I apologize. All right. Sorry about dropping you folks. Let me get back to where we were. He was eager to see me and suggested we meet, refusing to take no for an answer. Perhaps in resistance to my shyness over the bandages on my face, I was unable to turn him down, and I accepted. However, I was immediately tormented by regrets. How meaningless to persist in this scheme of, a sh in this scheme of foolish pride. The bandage alone would be enough to excite considerable curiosity, and since the bandaged man was beginning to delve into details of modeling techniques and facial anatomy, which were not his professional specialty, I would seem like some sneak thief in disguise. To avoid such discomfiture, discomfiture, to avoid such discomfiture, I should have refused categorically from the very first. What's more, I hated the streets. In all the diffident, casual glances, there were hidden needles bearing a corrosive poison, though those who had never been targets could not be expected to understand. The streets quite exhausted me. I felt like an oily dust cloth spotted with shame. Yet there was nothing to do but go to the appointed place, however reluctantly. The cafe we had agreed upon was on the street corner at the university, which I knew well. I took a taxi and was able to get as far as the door of the place almost unnoticed. However, my friend's confusion, greater than my own, was such that I pitied him. Damn it, I regained all my ill-tempered Ill self-possession. No, self-possession is misleading. Anyway... I'd like you, however, inadequately to imagine my wretchedness at making people around me uncomfortable just by my existence, like some stray mongrel. It was the desperate feeling of loneliness one sees in the eye of a decrepit old cur on the verge of death. It was an emptiness like the sound of track construction deep in the night when the pinging sings down the rails. Feeling that my expression I carried behind my bandage and my sunglasses would not get out had made me persevere. I suppose you're surprised, I said in a neutral voice. I was covered with liquid air. I'm apparently predisposed to calloids. Hmm, rather bad. The whole face is a 
regular web of scar tissue. You probably don't exactly fancy the bandage, but it's still better than letting people see what's underneath. With a perplexed expression, my companion muttered something, but I could hardly catch what he said. The reunion, how stridently had he insisted just 30 minutes ago that as soon as we met up, we should go where we could to get something to drink, was sticking in my throat like a fish bone. But the point was not to say disagreeable things, so I immediately changed the subject and broached the business at hand. Needless to say, he lost no time in grabbing at his life preserver. His explanation boiled down to this. A faithful reproduction of an original biological form is not possible by modeling upon the bone, no matter how experienced the modeler may be. What can be correctly judged from the anatomical structure of the bones is at best merely the placing of the tendons. Thus, for example, if you try to reconstruct a whale, which has especially developed subcutaneous tissue and fatty layers on the basis of a skeletal alone, you would get a monster, not in the slightest like a whale, something between a dog and a seal. If the track were possible, if the trick were possible, there wouldn't be such things as un unidentifiable skeletons. You don't have to go so far as a whale. A human face is a delicate thing, isn't it? It's not easily imitated even by a montage of photography. Yet, if it were absolutely impossible to get away from the bony structure, plastic surgery couldn't exist to start with. Whereupon, he took a qu quick glance at my bandages, mumbled embarrassedly, and fell silent. I didn't have to ask what worried him. No, let him think what he wanted. What was disagreeable, what is quite was his quite inexcusable blushing without making any attempt to hide to him. I'm going to restart this sentence. No, let him think what he wanted. What was disagreeable what was his quite inexcusable blushing without making any attempt to hide his discomfort. Excursus. I wonder what this shyness of mine is, fundamentally. Perhaps at this point, I should bring up the incident of the wig burning once again. The present situation is just the opposite. By having my wig discovered, I have... Disc... Hold on. By having my wig discovered, I have discountenanced my companion, which worries me even more. Is that the hidden key to solve the riddle that is my face? Yet he was a bungling fellow. Although I tried my best to muddle through the inoffense, ordinary conversation, he couldn't help stumbling and blushing. I had extracted from him most of what was directly pertinent to my plans. I should have left him then, with the uncomfortable memory of our meeting. Those things which evoke shame in me could easily become the source of gossip, but I was tempted to let rumors fly like a keyhole whisperings. His feeling of embarrassment was beginning to infect me too. I started in on justifications that were better left unsaid. I can just about imagine what you're thinking. You get ideas when you relate my questions to this bandage, don't you? but that would be a big mistake. It's too late for me at my age to begin worrying over an injured face. You're the one who's mistaken. What in heaven's name am I supposed to imagine? If I'm wrong, let it go. But even you unconsciously judge people by their faces, don't you? I think it's rather natural for you to be concerned about me. But if you really think about it, does an identity does an identity card fully identify the man it represents? My experience has made me do a lot of thinking. Don't we actually cling too much to our identity cards? Because of them, we produce freaks that devote themselves to forgery and alteration. I agree completely. Alteration is the right word. Quite. They say that women who wear heavy makeup are frequently hysterical, but... Incidentally, what would it be like if a man's face were an expressionless as an egg, 
with no eyes or nose or mouth. Hmm. You couldn't distinguish among people, I suppose, between thieves and policemen, assailants and victims, and my wife and the neighbor's wife, as if wanting help. He put a match to his cigarette and gave a short, soft laugh. That's interesting. Interesting. But there's still something of a problem. For heaven's sake, would human life be easier or not? And I laughed, and I too laughed with him. Perhaps I should have stopped at this point, but my thoughts had already taken to an uncontrollable momentum circling constantly around my face. They could only go on circling, aware of the danger until the centri centrifugal force broke them free. Life wouldn't be easier or not easier. Aren't both generalizations logically impossible? Since there's no correlation between, since there's no correlation, there can be no comparison. Good heavens, were you discussing the race problem? But isn't that something of an overblown interpretation? If it were possible, I should like to blow it up as much as I could to every single face in the world. Only with the mug like mine, the more I talk about it, the more it becomes a prisoner's lament. If you allow me to talk only about the race problem, but that's too unreasonable. Putting all responsibility on the face is, but I'm asking you, every time I daydream about people on other planets, I wonder why in heaven I always start with speculating on what they look like. We're getting off the track again, he said, vigorously stubbing out his cigarette after scarcely three puffs. It would suffice, I should imagine, if you simply explained it as being due to curiosity. I sensed keenly the sudden change of his tone, but just as abruptly as the plate stopped spinning in a game of spin the plate, my facade fell away. Just take a little look at that picture, I said, still not having learned from the experience and pointing to what was apparently a reproduction of a European Renaissance portrait. What do you think of that? Well, if I answer casually, you look as though you would snap me up, but well, it's stupid, isn't it? I suppose it is. Putting a halo back on the face like that is false. Deceptive idea. Because of it, the face is instilled with lies. There was a strange smile on my companion's face. It was a remote smile, as if he were looking at something far away, but his constraint had disappeared. It won't work. No matter how you exaggerate, I can't feel anything without first understanding. Is it because there aren't any common words between us? I specialize in extinct plants and animals, but in art, I lean away, I lean toward the modern. No, it was useless to complain. Better get used to such looks right now. To expect better results was only pampering myself. I had been able to get a hold of necessary information, and my first plan was to try to overcome my basic humiliation. I began to hate the paleontologist when I realized that the catch I had brought back for my visit was in reality merely incredible, inedible bait. Rather, it was apparently food stuff, but unfortunately, I didn't know anything about the art of cooking. Miserably, I reorganized the large margin of error in modeling. Even when one began with the same bone structure, forced the plane for the mask another step further. I could choose any face I wanted, but I did have to pick one, any one. But wouldn't any face at all be to my satisfaction? I should have to decide after sitting through numberless possibilities. What in heaven's name was the scale of measurement for faces? If you didn't intend special meaning to a face, then any would do. When you went to the trouble of making it, you didn't choose a cardiac's puffiness. Yet it probably wouldn't do at all to take a movie star as a model. This freedom, at first comforting, was in fact a terribly bothersome problem. I don't mean to insist unduly on the ideal face. Besides, such a thing doesn't exist. However, since I was going to make a selection, I had to have some standard or another, 
even an appropriate facial guide, however awkward, would somehow be all right. I hadn't the fairest notion whether to be subjective or objective, but when all was said or done, I dragged out the decision for close to half a year. Marginal note. It would be a mistake to settle this whole thing with vague standards. Rather, I should doubtless take into consideration my inner impulse to reject standards. Choosing a standard, in other words, is to commit oneself to others. However, at the same time, men have the opposite desire of trying to distinguish themselves from others. Perhaps the two could be related thus. So at this portion of the novel, it introduces a formula. I'm gonna to try to describe it for you folks. I could include an image of it. I probably will on screen, but I'm still going to explain what it looks like anyway. So A over B is equal to F with parentheses, one over N. A, the factor of commitment to others. B, the factor of resistance to others. N equals age. F equals one's degree of viscosity. Its decrease is the hardening of the self and at the same time the forming of the self, generally as it stands in an inverse proportion to age. But in a locus curve, one can observe a number of individual differences among people according to sex, personality, work, etc. In short, with age, the degree of my viscosity was, discrease, was decreasing very much, and I felt strong opposition to changing faces at this late date. I must doubtless admit that the paleontologist's view that heavily made up women are prone to hysteria is an extremely astute theory. Psychoanalytically speaking, hysteria is an infantile phenomenon. In the meantime, of course, I was not idle. I had a mountain of largely technical work, such as tests of material and the flat epidermis, and my engrossment provided me with a fine excuse to postpone the showdown. The flat epidermis took up an unimaginable amount of time. Quantitatively, it formed the most important part of the skin. But more than that, the successive failure of producing the feeling of mobile skin was at stake. I profited by my own colleague's distance from me in the laboratory and quite openly made use of the equipment and materials. But even so, it took more than three full months. I considered a comical contradiction that, while my plans for my mast advanced, I had taken no decision concerning the form of the face, but that did not worry me very much. Yet I could not forever take shelter from the rain under another's eaves. This period passed. Then the work began to make progress and I was gradually cornered. For the certain layer of the skin surface, I made a simple, very suitable discovery in the family of acrylic resins. And for the subcutaneous tissue, it would apparently be enough to spray something on the same quality as the skin itself into a sponge and let it harden. The fatty layer was easy. I could simply saturate a sponge with liquid silicon and make it airtight by enclosing it in a membrane. Thus, by the second week in the new year, I had completed my preparations as far as the materials were concerned. With things as they now stood, I could no longer make excuses. If I did not come to some decision about what sort of face to make, I could not advance a step further. But no matter how I thought about it, my head, like a museum storeroom, was in utter confusion with a thousand sample faces. Yet, if I kept shrinking from making a choice, I would never come to any decision. I borrowed a warehouse storage list, deciding there was no other course open to me except to gather my courage and check the faces off one by one. However, on the first page of the list appeared some unexpectedly obliging instructions. Rules for classification, which I read with pounding heart. The standard of value for faces is definitely objective. If one is involved in personal feelings, one makes the error of being taken in by imitations. So that was number one. And now number two, there is no such thing as a standard of value of faces. There are only pleasurable and displeasure, 
and the standard of selection is continually cultivated through refinement of taste. It was as I had anticipated, when one is advised that something is black and white at the same time, it would be better to have no advice at all. Moreover, as I read along comparing each face, I had the feeling that everyone could be equally justified and thus the degree of complication deepened. At last, I was sick at the thought of so many faces and still wonder why I didn't decide to put, up, to put a stop to my plans at that time. Currently, we're on page 45. I'm going to read about five more pages and then we're going to be around page 50. I'm going to stop us there for tonight. I can already feel my words sort of slurring and I can feel my eyes getting heavy, which is kind of the point of this entire video. Again about portraits. The paleontologist had made light of my ideas, but I could not help clinging to them. I think that the concept of portraiture, be what it may, artistically embodies a philosophy worthy of deeper inquiry. For example, in order for a portrait to be a universal representation, you have to accept as a premise the universe the universality of the human expression. That is, it is necessary for the majority of the people to be in general agreement that certain identical traits are to be behind a given expression. What supports this belief, of course, is doubtless, the empirical understanding that face and heart stand in a fixed relation to each other. Of course, there is no proof that experience is always reality. Yet it is likewise impossible to conclude that experience is always a pack of lies. Rather, isn't it more correct to assume the more earthy the experience, the greater the degree of truth it contains? Within these limits, I think it is impossible to deny that there is some good and an objective standard of values. On the other hand, we cannot disregard the fact that the same portrait changes its personality with the centuries. Our vision shifts from the classical harmony of heart and face to the representation of character devoid of harmony, completely collapsing into Picasso's eight-sided faces and Klee's false face. Which in God's name should one believe then? If I may express my own personal preference, of course, it would be the latter standpoint. I think that applying objective standards to the face is at all events too naive that isn't a dog this isn't a dog show when i was young even i used to associate a given face with the ideal personality i wanted to be marginal note that is this demonstrated a high degree of inclination toward others stemming from my high degree of viscosity naturally a romantic unordinary phase comes into focus through a blurred lens. However, it would never do to be forever addicted to such dreams. Indeed, hard cash is worth more than any kind of promissory note. There was nothing to do but pay what I could with the face I actually had. Don't men shun cosmetics because they believe in taking responsibility for their own faces? Of course, with women, that is women's makeup, it seems to me that they use it because their cash has reached rock bottom, hasn't it? I could not come to any decision at all. I felt so uneasy as if I was about to catch a cold, but nevertheless, I continued to make progress in technical areas where my concern was only with the surface of the face. After the materials came the casting of the back of the mask. No matter how permissive my colleagues were, I could not do that in the laboratory, and I decided to take my equipment home with me and set up workshop in my study. Ah, you seem to think that my enthusiasm for work was in compensation for my face, and moved to tears, you tried to help me. Indeed, it was compensation, but it was not the kind of enthusiasm you thought it was. I closed the door of the study and went so far as to turn the key. I shut out even your affection when you tried to bring me my evening snack. The work in which I immersed myself on the other side of the closed door was this. First, I prepared a basin large enough to contain my whole face and poured into, some, and poured into it potassium alginate, 
plaster of Paris, sodium phosphate, and silicone. Then, with all my facial muscles completely relaxed, I quickly thrust my face into the mixture. Within three to five minutes, the solution changed into calcium alginate in a plastic state. Since I could not be expected to hold my breath all this time, I inserted into my mouth a slender rubber tube that led to out of the basin. However, just imagine having to immobilize your expression for a time exposure. That is difficult enough. With repeated failures, a twitching under the eyes or an itchy nose, I was at it for four days before I got anything satisfactory. When I had finished, I began work on vacuum plating the inner side of the nickel with nickel. Since obviously I couldn't do that at home, I surreptitiously took the dye to the laboratory and keeping it out of sight, completed the plating there. At length, I came home to the finishing touches. At length, I came to the finishing touches. One evening after making certain you had gone to bed, I placed an iron crucible filled with the alloy of lead and antimony over a propane flame. The melted antimony took the color of cocoa mixed with too much milk. When I poured it carefully into the hollow of the mold, plated with potassium alginate, drops of white steam gently eddied up. A transparent blue smoke first spurt forcefully from the hole of the rubber breathing tube, then rose from all around the circumference of the mask. Perhaps the potassium alginate was scorching. There was a terrible stench. I opened the window, and the chill January wind suddenly snapped at my nostrils with its claws. I turned the mold upside down and shook it, separating the hardened antimony cast and extinguished the still-smoking potassium alginate base by submerging it in water. Silvery white scar webs, gleaming dully, flickered back at my own flesh-colored ones. Somehow I could not believe that this was my face. It was different. Too different. These could not possibly be the webs so familiar to me that I could scream. The ones I always saw in my mirror. Of course... Since the left and right of the antimony cast were the reverse of my face reflected in a mirror, some feeling of difference was unavoidable. Yet, I already experienced this much variation with photographs without acutely sensing a difference. Was it a question of color then? Of, according to Henry Boulan's Le Visage, when I f which I found in the library, a surprisingly intimate relationship apparently exists between facial color and expression. For example, a plaster of Paris death mask of a man will become that of a woman simply by the, con by the control of color. When I thought about this, color seemed a plausible answer. The ridges in the antimony cast were so slight to, as to be imperceptible if not held to the light. Such faint evenness would probably be nothing to fuss about in a mask. For an instant, I again started at the imprint of my scars. But I wasn't, but wasn't I unnecessarily wrestling with myself? Even these metal scar webs would have their own fine repulsiveness, I suppose, if they were tinted a flesh color. Perhaps it's a shame man isn't made of metal. If color was that important, tinting at the time of the final flesh modeling would have been done at the utmost care. As I passed my hand, almost in consolation, over the surface of the still warm antimony of the mottled face, with the pleasure of a blind man and the sense of touch, I was awed by the complexities in the manufacture of this mask. The completion of one's operation immediately prepared the way for another difficult problem. Of course, I devised an extraordinary challenge. I had already come quite far in amount of time and work, but the essential choice of a facial type was still hanging, and there was now the additional difficulty of coloring. With such problems, I wondered when I would realize my dream of being reborn in another face. No, certainly all the signs were not bad. The creases of the metallic scar webs made me reflect on the irrational role of the face. One must be sent packing like a mangy 
man mangy mongrel because of extra protuberances of barely two or three millimeters. Suddenly I discovered the really vulnerable spot in my enemy. These metallic scar webs could exist only as a negative picture for making the back of my mask. How shall I put it? It was a negative existence, which was to be covered over by the mask and thus wiped out. But was that all? It was indeed a negative existence, but even a mask that would wipe out the scar webs could not possibly exist without using them as a base. In short, this metal base was the point of departure for constructing the mask, and at the same time the mask's objective was to obliterate the base. Let's try thinking a little bit more concretely. For example, I could use simply I could simply use the eyes as they were, making no change in position, shape, or size. Suppose I went about it boldly. Should I make a jutting forehead, or should I make the lower part of the face project? Or, if neither of the two, should I make the whole thing bulge out with goggle eyes? The same went for the nose and the mouth. Indeed, the choice of a facial type was apparently not the most ambiguous thing I had imagined until now. Perhaps the manner of thinking was limiting compared to a slapdash grab bag freedom in choosing, but it was far more suited to my nature. In any event, this way I could see what had to be done. Even though I might take the long road of trial and error, first I had to try actually modeling and studying what facial type was possible with a finished mask. This way, this way of doing things really suited me. Apparently my colleague's criticism of me that I was more of a technician than a scientist was not altogether off the mark. Unaware, I became totally absorbed, plotting the metal base from every angle with my finger, holding my two hands over it, covering and shading it. The molded face was such a delicate thing. With the touch of a finger, it turned into a different person, more strange than a brother or cousin, with the turn of a palm, an utter stranger. I dare say this was the first time I was able to have such a positive feeling since I since I had started making this mask. All right, and that is, um, there's like mini chapter ends. Uh, so there's a, a large pause in text on page 50 here. So I think that this is where we're going to wrap things up for today. I'm going to grab a, I don't even know if this is really a bookmark. It's just a sliver of paper. I'm gonna count it as a bookmark though. And that's what we're gonna use it for. So we are at page 50 of The Face of Another. I'm going to pick this up at a later date, probably another time this week when I'm struggling to sleep. I already feel pretty positive about this. I know that it is an extremely difficult read, but I think it's the perfect thing to kind of exhaust my brain before bed. I, uh, I feel like nothing more than jumping into bed and just going to bed for the night. So I'm going to count this as a successful experiment. If you bother to listen to me rambling this book aloud, I want to say thank you. It's not an easy feat. Um, it's a difficult read altogether. And I'm sure listening to it without the basis of having the book in front of you is probably going to be an extreme challenge. I'll probably include links to the book down in the description, just because I think it would be very easy to read along with. But just hearing me out and with the pair of the visual provided without the book, I imagine it's kind of hard. Um, but yeah, I will pick this up at another time. Thank you for joining me on this windswept, rain-filled night, and I hope you have a good one. Thanks, guys.